Senator Dizek. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On that motion, any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members, if you'll be so kind as to stand. Members, today's chaplain is Reverend Dr. Dwayne Davis from Plymouth Congregational Church in Minneapolis. And as usual, following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Holy One, source of wonder, wisdom, and wholeness. Thank you for the blessings and privilege of public service. Through the greatness of your mercy, we have been afforded this opportunity to serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We hold this public trust with humility and gratitude. And as we do this work for the people on this day, saturate our political interests and agendas with spiritual creativity, unleashing within us a generous regard for our neighbors and a zealous pursuit of the common good. Help us to rise above the cruel exclusivism and the dangerous extremism that rend the social fabric when we see our political opponents as existential threats to be vanquished. Change us. May a generous peace rest and abide within and among all who do the people's business, such that our work here makes life better for all citizens. Let us not be satisfied to be only a political community. Help us also to be a spiritual community a united people motivated by a spirit of service, generosity, and neighborliness. Kindle within us a desire to always do good. In the name of all that is holy, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. Thank you, members. The secretary will take the roll. Abler, Anderson, Barr, Bolden, Carlson, Champion, Coleman, Swadzinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Draskowski, Duckworth, Diedzik, Eichhorn, Farnsworth, Fateh, Friends, Green, Grunhagen, Gustafson, Hoschild, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Jasinski, Johnson, Klein, Coran, Kroon, Kunish, Kupek, Lang, Latz, Liskey, Limmer, Lucero, Mann, Marty, Matthews, May Quaid, McEwen, Miller, Mitchell, Mohammed, Morrison, Murphy, Nelson, Umover, Baton, Pappas, Pa, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rasmussen, Rest, Seeberger, Utke, Weber, Wiesenberg, Westland, Westrom, Wickland, Zhang. Members, a quorum is present. As usual, members, you can follow along with me by looking at the Senate agenda for today, Thursday, March 9th, 2023. We will begin with the second order of business, executive and official communications. The following communications was received and referred as indicated. Members, we will now proceed to the third order of business, messages from the House. The Secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce the adoption by the House of the following Senate Concurrent Resolution herewith returned. Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 3, a Senate Concurrent Resolution adopting deadlines for the 2023 regular session. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Members, no action is required. We will now proceed to the fifth order of business. Senator Dizek for motion to adopt committee reports. Senator Dizek. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I move that committee reports printed in the agenda be adopted, and I ask for a roll call. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Any discussions on that motion? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll.
Members, please vote. Anyone else? All senators voting, all senators having voting who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 39 yeas and 15 noes. The motion to adopt prevails. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the sixth order of business. Second reading of Senate bills, the secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file numbers 2548, 2001, 2437, 37, 47, 1497, 753, and 67. The Senate files have been given their second reading. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the seventh order of business, second reader, reading of House bills. The Secretary will read the House file number. House file number 244. The House file has been given its second reading. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the eighth order of business, introduction and first reading of Senate bills. There's one introduction to read. Senator Pappas introduced Senate file 2798, a bill for an act relating to public safety, modifying the Minneapolis Police Department appointments. Members, the bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading. The referral is to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Now, members, the bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Members, if you want to follow along with me where the changes are, you can proceed to page number one. Senate file number 2759, that bill has been referred to, uh, referred to Judiciary and Public Safety. On page number two, you also see Senate file number 2762. That bill has been referred to the Committee on Capital Investments. Also, Senate file number 2764. That bill has been referred to the Committee on Capital Investments. Also, Senate file number 2768. That bill has been referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. If you now go to Members, you can now proceed to page number four, and you'll see Senate file number 2782. That bill has been referred to the Committee on Labor. You can also go to page number five, and you will see Senate file number 2796. That bill has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. Members, as I indicated, the bills listed on today's introduction calendar are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Members, we will now proceed to the ninth order of business, motions and resolutions. We will adopt the author's motions as one motion. All in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Members, we have some uh, single or, or individual senator motions. We will now proceed to Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1028 be withdrawn from the Committee on Finance and re-referred to the Committee on Education Finance. It is my bill, Mr. President, and I have spoken with both the chairs, and they are agreeable. Thank you, Senator Friends. Senator Friends moves that Senate File Number 1028 be withdrawn from the Committee on Finance and re-referred to the Committee on Education Finance. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Latz. Mr. President, I move that Senate File 1134 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and re referred to the Committee on Transportation. This is my bill, and I've talked to both chairs, and they agree. 
Thank you, Senator Lass. Senator Lass moved that Senate file number 1134 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and re-referred to the Committee on Transportation. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to move that Senate File 1394 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and re referred to the Committee on Elections. This is Thank my you bill. so much. Uh, Senator May Quay, is this your bill? And this did is... you talk to both chairs? Yes and yes, Mr. President. And they're in agreement? Yes, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator May Quay. Senator May Quay moves that Senate File Number 1394 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety and re refer to the Committee on Elections. Any discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Dizik. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 1657 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. This is my bill, and I've talked to both chairs, and they are agreement. Thank you, Senator Dizik. Senator Dizik moves that Senate File 1657 be withdrawn from the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans and re refer to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that Senate file number 1959 be withdrawn from the Committee on Labor and be re referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Mr. President, this is my bill, and I've spoken with both of the chairs, and they are in agreement. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Senator Dibble moved that Senate File 1959 be withdrawn from the Committee on Labor and re referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Gustafson. Mr. President, um, I move that Senate File 2019 be stricken and re referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. This is my bill, and I have talked to the chair, and he is in agreement. All right, Senator, thank you, Senator Gustafson. Senator Gustafson moves that Senate File Number 29, 2019, Number 57 on General Orders, be stricken and re referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Any discussions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I move that Senate file number 2584 be withdrawn from the Committee on Transportation and be re-referred to the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans. I have spoken with myself. I've spoken with the Chair of State and Local Government. Uh, I'm in agreement. So is she. Uh, and we're good. Well, Senator Dibble, it's good to know that you agree with yourself. Uh, Senator Dibble moves that Senate File 2584 be withdrawn from the Committee on Transportation and re referred to the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans. Any discussion? Mr. President, would, would Senator uh, Dibble rise for a question? Senator Coran. Senator Dibble, will you, rise, uh, will you yield Thank to a question? He will. Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dibble. This bill, it seems odd to move it from the Committee of Origin, which is yours, into state government when it actually appears to be assigned to the appropriate uh, committee from the start. Could you tell us what the path is, the desired path, or what the plan you plan, plan to take for this particular bill? Senator Dibble, to the question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, the Committee on State and Local Government has jurisdiction over an element of the bill, um, which has to do with rules. Um, it also needs to stop off in the Environment Committee. Um, it might have other committees to go to and ultimately would end up uh, in transportation. That was the intention for it to start on its path and, and then ultimately end up in transportation. So it will, Senator Cran, if that's your concern, it will end up in transportation at some point if it uh, enjoys the support of members along the way. Thank you. Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator Debel. Senator Dibble, would, would Senator Dibble rise for another question? Senator Dibble, we'll yield full question. Senator Coran. Senator Dibble, um, Mr. President, Senator Dibble, um, you didn't mention that it, you intend to move through ag, or at least you didn't identify as moving it through ag. Do you intend to have that referred to ag at some point? Senator Dibble, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, Senator Coran, quite possibly so. I haven't uh, spoken with the ag chair, but um, Maybe. I'm not entirely sure. Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Putman rise for a question? 
Senator, where is Senator Hoffman is not on the floor. Putnam. Putnam. Oh, Putnam. I'm sorry. Uh, Senator Putnam. Uh, there is Senator Hoffman. Thank you. But Senator Putnam, will you have a full question? Uh, Senator Coran. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, and uh, Senator Putnam, uh, do you intend to request uh, to make sure this uh, profound uh, change in fuel standards bill comes and ensures that it goes to the Ag Committee? Senator Putnam, to the question. Mr. President, Senator Coran, I was just in a conversation about that this today, and I will continue to have those conversations and more with Senator Dubow as well. Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, would Senator Putnam rise uh, for one more question? Senator Putnam will yield for another question. Senator Coran. Senator Putnam, I'm confused that there would be any hesitation in moving this through ag. This bill seems to change fuel standards drastically in the state of Minnesota and would eliminate all liquid fuels. I think that would be pretty important to your district and I would think it would be, uh, no, uh, there should be no hesitation and an affirmation that you would require that bill to come through your committee. Are you sure you're going to, um, will you make sure that that bill comes to your committee? Senator Putnam. Mr. President, Senator Cran, Senator Cran has mistaken uh, consideration for hesitation. Uh, I'm a big fan of collaboration and conversation, and I will be engaged in those conversations. In no way does that imply hesitation. Uh, it implies being deliberate and thoughtful about what we do here. Senator Coran. Thank you, Mr. President. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Member, Senator Dibbo moves that Senate File 2584 be withdrawn from the Committee on Transportation and re-referred to the Committee on State and Local Governments and Veterans. Seeing that there's no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 29 be withdrawn from the Committee on Taxes, given a second reading, and placed on general orders. This is an urgency, Mr. President. While we sit on $12.5 billion left over, from the previous session when tax relief was agreed upon, but the House refused to take it up. And now with our most recent budget forecast, it's a $17.5 billion budget, and that includes taking out over a billion dollars for automatic inflation. The issue, the urgency, Mr. President, is that Minnesotans are struggling. They are struggling to pay their bills, energy, eggs, everything you can think of is escalating, and yet Minnesotans are on fixed incomes. My bill, this bill, Senate File 29, would remove forever the taxation on all Social Security benefits, including disability benefits. It is time, Mr. President, that we get this done. It was agreed upon last year. The House refused to take it up. Minnesota seniors continue to struggle just to keep the lights on, just to pay 30% increase in heating costs, to buy eggs at $5 a dozen, and their incomes are fixed, Mr. President. 11, only 11 other states continue to double taxation that continue to tax Minnesota seniors. It is time, Mr. President, that we bring this to the floor and let Minnesotans vote on it today. In fact, right here in this chamber, Mr. President, we have four senators in the majority party who campaigned on saying that they would totally remove the taxation on Social Security benefits. We should allow those members to keep their campaign promises, just like all the Republicans in this chamber who supported eliminating the taxation on all Social Security benefits. And it's important to know, Mr. President, that these benefits also apply to Social Security for the disabled. We should not be taxing those benefits. I encourage, Mr. President, that we remove this from taxes today, get it on the Senate floor today. And I ask for a roll call, Mr. President. Roll call uh, requested, roll call given. Members, I just want to caution us, and then I'll go to Senator um, Ress. It is not in order, according to Masons, to discuss the merits of a proposal upon a motion to discharge a committee or withdraw the proposal from committee. 
So I just want to caution us. I, I know I try to allow it as much as possible, but I just want us to be a little contained. Senator Rest. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the point that you are bringing up. Technically, um, the a point of order was made uh, recently, um, but it was on a uh, similar subject, but uh, not the same bill. Nevertheless, um, we will be discussing the contents of uh, <clears throat> the bill that Senator uh, Nelson referred to, and uh, it's not necessary to bring it up today. Um, and I would ask for a no vote. Thank you, Mr. President. And members, just so you know what, what pr pr provision in Masons I was referring to, just so you can reference it, is section 491.4. Just so that we uh, know that, and I, I don't mind being helpful, but we want to make sure that we are, um, it's not in order to discuss the mayors. Senator Grudenhagen. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I have to rise in support of uh, Senator Nelson's uh, motion to bring SF-29. You know, I do have to speak for my constituents for just a moment. Uh, many of these people are on fixed incomes. They're having a hard time to meet the basics. And also, if we look at statewide, we see that uh, we lost population-wise almost 20,000 Minnesotans last year. I just got an email from a lady uh, a couple days ago that said she's leaving Minnesota. She loves Minnesota, but she is leaving Minnesota with the taxation on Social Security and the high cost of everything. And uh, so I think we're chasing out some of our best citizens, and we're also punishing those that are on fixed incomes. So I would urge a yes vote on Senator Nelson's uh, SF-29. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to go to Senator Pratt before you, Senator Jaskowski, because he was up first. And just so that we also know in that same provision, because I did leave out some things, it says debate in such cases must be confined strictly to the purpose of the motion. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. The purpose of the motion is urgency. This bill is extremely timely. We need to get it done, and we need to get it done today, members. As I mentioned last week, we have senior citizens that are preparing their tax returns. But even more than that, Mr. President, and you were in the hearing today, in finance, we have spent over a half a billion dollars, and we don't even have targets yet. We are spending away any opportunity to give Minnesota seniors tax relief while they are working on their taxes today. And if we don't pass this now, they're going to have to incur the cost and the effort to refile these tax returns. Minnesotans expect us to do this. It was part of last year's tax conference committee agreement. House Democrats didn't take it up. It's up to us to take it up, to move this to the floor and get it done so that Minnesota seniors can get their taxes done in a timely manner. Members, let's get this passed before we spend the entire surplus before we even set budget targets. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this is urgent. We have heard uh, throughout the campaign, we have heard the, incre the increased drumbeat from Minnesotans saying, we need to deal with this. We have not. Uh, we've heard it in tax committee. Senator Rest is right, but members, it's bottled up there. It's at the end of the line of discussions. We are seeing bills come forward that are continuing to eat away at this surplus, all kinds of proposals to spend down the money. There's more proposals, Mr. President, to spend the money than there is surplus money there. That means, Mr. President, this proposal is currently at the end of the line. Minnesotans want this proposal to be to the front of the line, on top, for us to deal with here today. We can do it and get it done and make certain that the interests of Minnesotans, of these seniors of Minnesotans, many of them the oldest among us in our state uh, that are asking for this, we want to certainly support the old people of Minnesota, Mr. President, and they are being left in the dust by all the rest of the proposals that are coming to the front of the line and stepping in front of them. They expect this to happen. We need to deal with it today, Mr. President. Please, members, support Senator Nelson's motion to bring 
Senate File 29 to the front of the line on behalf of the elderly people in Minnesota that know and expect us to act. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Seeberger. Thank you, Mr. President. I did run on this issue. I do take the full elimination of Social Security benefits seriously, and I continue to call for that. But what I want to do is I want to do it properly. This bill has been heard in taxes. This bill is still under consideration. And in fact, the bill that I am a proponent of includes not only a full elimination of Social Security taxes, but an elimination of the taxes on the pension benefits for our public uh, safety officers um, who do not receive Social Security benefits. And, and I'm alarmed to hear that part of the discussion left out. I believe in proceeding on this the right way. A yes vote today on the floor on this motion will not move the issue forward. It will result in uh, appearances uh, that I do not support this when in fact I do. So if you see me voting no on this motion, it is not because I do not support a full elimination of Social Security taxes uh, and an elimination of taxes on the pension benefits. I do. It's because I want to see it done the right way and I uh, don't appreciate the gamesmanship. Thank you very much. Senator Wiesenberger. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't stand up and talk about supporting this bill. I had a couple of meetings yesterday in my office, and um, they were talking about seniors in their area that you know, literally need help eating right now. This is something that needs to happen right now. They need money. and they're starving. Um, we need to vote for this and we need to get this money in their pockets. Thank you. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. I too rise uh, in support of this motion. Members, this is not something that we bring up uh, out of gamesmanship as the characterizations often made. This has been a years long effort by our caucus to get this gigantic surplus that Minnesota is sitting on back in the pockets of the people of Minnesota and specifically our seniors that are struggling financially all around the state. And I also want to mention why this is urgent is because the majority party wants to try to move forward with the bonding bill. And I believe that there is one scheduled coming up, I believe Friday uh, later this week. And everyone that I talk to is astonished that the uh, majority party now wants to bring out the credit card and swipe it to the tune of billions of dollars without first giving some of this surplus and this money back to Minnesotans. And so, Mr. President, you well know, and the majority well knows, uh, there is room to have a win-win for both of these goals in the very near future. We need to pass some tax relief that if we brought this bill up onto the floor, it would get a large bipartisan vote of support in favor of giving money back to the senior citizens of Minnesota through Social Security. And then the majority wants to have their other projects of the bonding requests that go around uh, with the state of Minnesota. And that would also get the necessary bipartisan votes uh, to get those projects done. So I want to urge the majority party to think long and carefully about this. You don't flush another opportunity to have a strong win-win situation here uh, for differing needs that we can accomplish simultaneously here in Minnesota. We need to have tax relief in order uh, for many Minnesotans to be okay with us going ahead and swiping the credit card for more bonding projects. So with that, I'd urge your support for the motion on the Nelson bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just want to speak to the urgency of this particular proposal by Senator Nelson. Uh, I am in full support uh, bringing this up on the floor and having a vote. Our, me our motives were just questioned here a, a moment ago about why we're doing this. We're, this is gamesmanship. This is not gamesmanship. This is our one opportunity to make sure that we're doing right by Minnesotans. 
We've been asked at the doors over and over and over again, in our cafes, in the meetings that we have at the nursing homes, at our church, we've been talking to people. This is the number one thing that Minnesotans are asking for. And already, you see Democrats backing away from full Social Security relief. Now, we want to see that happen. You've seen us up on the floor. We are very earnest about this proposal. This isn't gamesmanship. This is reality. This is people's lives, day in and day out, depending on those dollars coming into their pockets so they can afford the daily necessities. Now, what assurance do we have of that? Well, the only thing that we have to go on is a bonding bill, right? That's the only thing that requires Republican votes. So what we're saying is we want to have a bonding bill. We want this to go forward with the bonding bill. But let's see movement on tax. Let's see a good faith movement on these tax proposals that, folks, it sounds like everybody is for. We hear everybody say, I am for this. Let's work together. This is what Minnesota asked us to do. This is the most common sense win-win proposal, and yet every time we bring it up, party line votes, no, we're not going to do what Minnesotans want. This is getting ridiculous. We have an opportunity today. This is on the floor. Let's get this done, and then we can move on to bonding, that we can invest more into Minnesota, improve Minnesotans' lives. This gamemanship has got to stop. We need this done, and today is a good day to do it. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate it. And we've heard uh, many reasons why this bill is urgent. And I read uh, a news article just yesterday, I think, that demonstrates that urgency. It said that credit card debt is at an all-time high. Nearly 25 million people are behind on their credit card, auto loan, or personal loan payments. And the nation has not seen anything that high since 2009 in the midst of the Great Recession. Many households are also behind on their utility bills. 20.5 million homes had overdue balances in January. The number of households applying for help to pay their utility bills is the highest it's been since 2011. This is not a game. It's certainly not a game to our seniors who were promised the full elimination of the tax on Social Security. That's why this is urgent, Mr. President. And I'll be honest with you, in, in past sessions, and we've brought this bill up, and we've heard affirmation uh, from our friends across the aisle that they're working on this and planning to get it done. You know, I, would, it would, yeah, I respect them. Take them at the word, and hopefully we're finding a way forward. But I would tell you, this has become more urgent to me today, now more than ever, because recently, I've heard friends across the aisle specifically beginning to walk back that promise and offer different ideas when it comes to the tax on Social Security other than a full elimination. Well, maybe we could just do it for a few, or maybe we shouldn't apply it to all of our seniors, or maybe it's just for some. That's not what was promised. It's not what seniors in the state are expecting. That's why Senator Nelson's uh, motion before us is extremely urgent, should be acted on today. We can take that bill up and we can amend the pension language to it today. We can find bipartisan agreement. and We can move the dial for our seniors. I can't believe we are seriously considering borrowing $1.5 billion and paying millions in interest for a bonding bill while the state is sitting on $18.5 billion of taxpayer money in surplus. We're three months into session. We've done nothing to give any of that money back to taxpayers. We've done nothing to help our seniors. It's time we hold true to our word. I've done the math. 33 Republicans plus four Democrats equals 37 votes. We can make this law today. We can provide relief in a bipartisanship in a bipartisan manner. Mr. President, I hope we can get it done. Vote green on Senator Nelson's motion. Thank you. Members, I just want to remind us, under Mason's Section 491, Mason's uses a, a term in here that I want us to, to underscore. Debate in such cases must be confined, number one, strictly. That's not a word I'm putting in there. So members, let's please not debate the underlining uh, other things. This is not a debate about the bonding bill, please. I'm just asking you to abide by Masons. With that being said, I'm going to Senator Friends. 
Thank you, Mr. President. And Mr. President, I believe the motion is to debate the urgency. And I wonder if Senator Nelson would yield to a question. Senator Nelson, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Nelson, what is the effective date of Senate File 29 for which you make the urgency motion? S Senator Nelson, to, your, uh, to the question. Thank you, Mr. President. I will have to pull it up and look. But I can tell you that uh, Minnesotans are planning their taxes now, they are, they are filing their taxes now, but more importantly, Minnesotans are leaving Minnesota based often on our tax climate. So laws are such as the uh, restrictive law that we have on taxing Social Security is affecting Minnesotans' behavior today, knowing that we will be eliminating the taxation on Social Security benefits, including eliminating the taxation on disability benefits, will make a difference in Minnesotans' action now. I will look up the bill, and uh, I imagine you have it in front of you, Senator Friends. Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Nelson. As a matter of fact, I do members who support an urgency ought to know that the effective date in the bill that we're debating is December 31st, 2022. In other words, to be clear, the bill does not affect the 2022 tax year. I believe that, Mr. President, that goes to the question of urgency. I will refrain from the larger debate as soon as I point out that we've passed over $100 million in tax relief this session already. I'll refrain from that, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, or, sorry, Mr. President. Again, I stand up in support of Senate File 29 being brought to the floor today. Again, folks, uh, we need to deserve this for Minnesotans that need the tax relief. And I know the bonding bill has been brought up and brought up, and I want a great bonding bill. But uh, if, if there was reversed by the majority power, uh, they were the other side of the issue. They would be the same deal. They would be doing the same issues. They would want to get something they would want before they would pass on a bonding bill. So, folks, we know Minnesotans need this. Uh, we know we need a bonding bill. Let's show some effort to work together, pass a tax bill, eliminate the tax on Social Security, and let's get a good bonding bill done for Minnesota. Senator Hostile. Thank you, Mr. President. I also ran on this issue. But you know what else I ran on? I ran on child care tax credits for young families who are having trouble affording child care. I ran on local government aid and county program aid for all the burdens that we've put on our counties and our local communities. I ran on bonding to get our projects going in our local communities, many of which those communities have lacked a bonding project uh, over the last several years. And so to focus on one particular issue uh, before us when we have plenty of other relief that we need to provide families all across Minnesota, I think is a little disingenuous. I look forward to continuing the process of advocating for the Social Security tax relief alongside several other issues because we know that Minnesotans need this relief and we'll have a strong tax bill at the end of the year. Thank you. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise because there is an incredible urgency across Minnesota. And the bill, to br the motion to bring this to the floor, the Nelson, Nelson motion to bring this to the floor, is to recognize that urgency. It is very much a legitimate process to bring bills to this floor when the body recognizes that there is the urgency that is clearly being felt by seniors across Minnesota, those on fixed income across Minnesota. Now, I have heard, as we just heard from another senator, that there may be other issues that they campaigned on. The, there can be a similar motion to bring those to the floor. But the motion before us right now is the urgency. So, Mr. President, just yesterday, I began to receive in the mail the tax statements that will be effect uh, for tax values, for property taxes. And residents across the state, similarly so. So because of the additional costs, taxes and otherwise, that our seniors, those on fixed incomes, are having to pay, we in this body have the opportunity to recognize that urgency, and we can act today. 
and we can provide that relief, and this relief can become law, and we can join the other states. Right now, we are one of 11 that still tax Social Security. There's no reason to delay. And because we can act, we should do so, Mr. President. Thank you. Senator Nelson, I'm going to just wait and make sure that there's no one else because you're the author of the, mem the, the motion. Uh, Senator Jaskowski, uh, before you, anyone else? Then it's going to go Senator Jaskowski and then to the author of the uh, motion. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the urgency of this is the focus and the urgency of Minnesotans to get a full repeal of the income tax that they are forced to pay on Social Security benefits. Uh, we have heard members, Mr. President, suggest, we, got, we know there's four members of the Senate that uh, openly support and have supported in their campaign the full repeal, and that's what this bill represents, Mr. President. Mr. President, members, and we've heard from Senator Seeberger, we heard from Senator Hochschild, and I'm expecting to hear from Senator Kupek and also from Senator Gustafson, four members that campaigned on this. And the bill, Mr. President, that is in the tax committee, again, is bottled up there. And we know that the chief executive, the governor of this state, in his budget proposal did not offer the full repeal of Social Security, uh, the income tax on Social Security, in his budget. The leader of the majority party here in Minnesota is not supporting the full repeal of this t onerous tax for elderly Minnesotans. And so the reality is, and I think the members need to be reminded, Mr. President, around this urgency, and certainly, Mr. President, the voters in the district of those four members need to be reminded, this urgency is so important because this is the opportunity for full repeal right here on the Senate floor. If, Mr. President, we continue to wait and allow the bill that's being discussed in tax committee, which is at the end of the line, to be the only ray of hope for us, we are going to end up with a skinny down bill that leaves lots of Minnesotans in the dust. We are not going to get a full repeal of the, the income tax on Social Security benefits. The only way for that to happen is here today in front of the Minnesota Senate, brought forward to the floor, unabated, without any amendment that's going to happen in committee, because that's what's going to happen, Mr. President, in committee, is it's going to be skinny down and turned into something that is not the pure and unabated and full repeal for all of the seniors in Minnesota. That's what this bill represents. If we don't do this, Minnesota is not going to get the full repeal of Social Security income tax. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Last uh, lead uh, for the for the uh, author of the motion. And again, I'm going to remind us of 491.4 that we want to stick to the uh, strictly to the purpose of the motion and not the mayors of the bill. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the opportunity that we have had to discuss the urgency of Senate File 29. I believe the public that is watching is well aware. But I rise, Mr. President, about the debate that we just had on this floor, the brief debate, whatever it was, and I would refer the President to Section 124 of Masons. Now, I will note, as you pull that up, Mr. President, that this is Senate File 29 is not the full robust tax bill. We know that there will be a full robust tax bill coming out of the tax committee in due time. But this, uh, this, amendment, uh, this motion was for the urgency of this one provision. Now, I will not call it a deflection of the issue, Mr. President, when some said that because everything else was not in the Senate 29, that uh, it was not, uh, it was not in a critical vote. That, Mr. President, would be impugning motives of a senator. I would not do that. Just as I stand to note 
that to say that my motion was disingenuous is impugning the motives of a Senate, of a member. Mr. President, I believe we are better than that. And we stand with Masons 124, point one and point three, and I would just like to bring that to your attention, Mr. President, thank you. Members, this is a good time for me to just remind us all of something before we go directly to the vote. Under uh, 124.1, it says, in debate, a member must confine remarks to the proposal before the House and avoid personalities. I think that we all can, can take heed to that. Then it also says in point three, it is not the member but the proposal that is subject of debate and is not allowable to impugn the motives of a member, but the nature or consequences of a proposal may be condemned in strong terms. But what that also means is that we should reframe as much as humanly possible by cast castigating each other. That's not senatorial. That is not appropriate for this body. So that's just a word for all of us, even when it comes to be adhering to the, the rules, when it comes to strictly only talking about the proposal and nothing else. So just adhere to that, members. Thank you so very much. The secretary will take the roll. On Social Security, do you want? Mr. President. Senator Jasinski for uh, those Senator, voting go ahead. under Rule 40.7. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes, votes aye. Members, please vote. Mr. President. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Housley votes aye. Senator Housley votes aye. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the motion is not adopted. <laughs> Members, there's going to be a, a slight um, moment where I'm going to my seat, so Senator Rest is going to come up. So if you give us just one moment.
Remaining on uh, motions and resolutions, Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I move that Senate file number 395 be withdrawn from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety, given a second reading and placed on general orders. And I would be happy to speak to that motion when the President allows. Uh, Senator Limmer. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, members, um, I would like to ask Senator Champion a question. Would he yield? Senator Champion, do you yield? He does. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Champion, uh, your bill regards uh, criminal expunged records, and this bill has not gone to the Judiciary Committee. It's seeking to jump over that and move on. Uh, I would like to have you explain why. Senator Champion. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam President, Senator Limmer. Senator Limmer, we did refer this bill to ju Judiciary. Uh, and uh, then we got a message that judiciary did not need to hear this particular bill um, as it really relates a lot more to um, DHS because what DHS really only wants is to make sure that they receive notice as to when a person files for an expungement. So there's nothing that affects the expungement process, nothing that affects uh, the judiciary, but, but only wanting to make sure that the Department of uh, uh, or MDH receives the notice, and that's why. And we did go through um, the health department, excuse me, the health committees, and uh, Madam President and Senator Limmer, that's what they conveyed to us. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Madam President. Members, uh, this particular bill makes reference to um, the Health and Human Services Commissioner to change existing law regarding people who want to work in the industry who may have an expunged record. The existing law says the commissioner may review those records. The bill changes the direction and it prohibits the commissioner from examining anything of an expunged record. Uh, I'm a little concerned about that. Uh, this area of law makes reference to the national criminal history check in the past. It relies on a national sex offender public website. Quite honestly, I think this is an area of law that should have the examination and analysis of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, if it's something uh, of an altruistic nature that uh, we want to move forward in this direction, fine. But I think the Judiciary Committee should try to understand what the bill is fully doing. It is a change in existing law, and quite honestly, I would hope that there wouldn't be any mistakes in the commissioner's, well, the commissioner can't make a mistake because the commissioner would be prohibited from examining. So uh, quite honestly, I think this is a bill that should at least get a, get a pass through and examined by the Judiciary Committee. Madam President. Further discussion, Senator Champion. Just briefly, Madam President, just f to the body for clarity, this bill does not change anything as it pertains to current expungement laws or, or anything of that nature, none. Um, and in fact, it doesn't change anything, especially if you look at rule 3.1, excuse me, 3.4, where it says nothing in this paragraph prohibits the commissioner from considering information from a separate administrative decision under this chapter. So, and right now, under our expungement laws, commissioners and others, law enforcement, uh, as well as judges are able to look at an expunged or sealed record. It does nothing other than make sure that a person is notified that if they want an expungement of executive branch records, especially as it pertains to the Department of Human Services, that um, they have to be notified, and that would be uh, consistent. So I would ask um, uh, the, the members to uh, support the uh, motion. And again, I did submit this to judiciary. They looked at it, Senate Council looked at it, and this is the information that I've received. Thank you. 
Further Madam discussion Chair? on Senator Champion's motion. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Madam President. And, uh, uh, Senator Limmer, I'm going to remind you of Rule 36.5 that other than speaking on special orders, members are not supposed to speak more than two times on any item before the Senate. All right. But I'm Thank calling you. on you and I ask you to proceed. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, in the existing proposal of Senator Champions on lines 2, 26 through 27, it states the commissioner shall not, that's the new language, not consider an expunged record of 609A any underlying fact including a charge or an arrest. And quite honestly, uh, that's exactly what we need to look at. And so, Madam President, uh, if this would pass, uh, a person that would have a sealed record would not have any exposure to the commissioner uh, for a potential job. Senator An Limmer, I need to remind you to keep your remarks directed toward the motion, which is not the bill that is being withdrawn or proposed to be withdrawn right. and moved uh, to an to. Um, um, where it is, uh, to general, general orders. All right. Please, on that motion, not the content of the bill, please. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, this existing bill makes reference to Chapter 609. It makes references to expungement records. These are subjects that are uh, eligible for scrutiny in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, this proposal is to skip over the judiciary or the motion before us to skip over that committee. Quite honestly, I think it should be moved to the judiciary committee. Thank you. Senator Madam Champion. President, roll call requested. There will be a roll call on the motion um, proposed by Senator Champion. The secretary will take the roll. Can't be up here. Senator Friends. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to report a yes vote for Senator Putnam. Senator Putnam votes aye. And Madam President, I would like to report a yes vote for Senator Morrison. Senator Morrison votes aye. All members having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 
ayes and 29 may, nays, the, um, the motion prevails. Um, Senate file 395 is given its second reading and placed on general orders. The secretary will give the bill its second reading. Excuse Senate me. file 395. Remaining under, remaining under motions and resolutions, uh, Senator Dietzik. Uh, Madam President, I move to take up the confirmation calendar. Um, to that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The, the motion prevails. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I move that the report from the Committee on Jobs and Economic Development reported on January 25th, 2023, pertaining to appointments be taken from the table. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. Motion prevails. Senator Champion. Madam President, I move that the foregoing report be now adopted. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Opposed say no. no. Motion prevails. Senator Champion. Madam President, I move that in accordance with the report from the Committee on Jobs and Economic Development reported on January 25th, 2023, the Senate, having given its advice, do now consent to and confirm the appointment of Ida Rukavina. And I'd be happy to speak to that motion, Madam President. Senator Champion. Madam President, uh, Ida Rukavina was appointed, Rukavina was appointed by Governor Walls to serve as Commissioner of, of the Department of the Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation, affectionately known as the IRRRB. She's testified before the Jobs and Economic Development Committee to discuss her background and qualifications for a role as Commissioner. Ms. Rukavina was born and raised on the, the uh, Misabi Iron Range of Northeastern Minnesota. She is honored to now leave an agency that has such a strong impact on the people and the region she loves. She has the respect of communities, businesses, nonprofits and professional organizations, educational institutions, and people in the region to effectively assume this leadership role. Not to mention she comes from great stock because her father served in this uh, body or the legislature, none other than Tommy Rukavina. The agency's mission is to invest resources to foster vibrant growth and economic prosperity in northeastern Minnesota by enhancing livable communities, maximizing collaborations and partnerships, and strengthening business and worker education. Ms. Rukavina's professional education and community service experience has prepared her well to serve in this new role and lead a state agency to achieve its mission, one that is so vital to northeastern Minnesota. She has strong relationships members, not only in northeastern Minnesota, but across the state. She understands the region's history, industries, resources, economy, and challenges. Her vision for the agency is to work towards a future that includes jobs that support families, a strong educational system, and thriving cities and towns. Through the agency's grant and loan programs, she is committed to ensuring that local businesses, communities, and schools in northeastern Minnesota have the resources they need to grow and prosper. Key areas that she would like the agency to focus on include business development and expansion, broadband, infrastructure, Main Street revitalization, child care, and preparing employees to work in the skilled trades. Prior to her appointment by Governor Wall, she served as executive director of the Range Association of Municipalities and schools, also known as, as RAMS, where she managed and directed a 24-member elected board of directors and more than 60 members, public sector members as well. As well as private sector corporate members. She worked closely with legislators, the Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation staff and area economic develop, development entities to further community development and quality of life for all member units. Throughout her career, she has worked in government and the lab, labor movement, 
representing public and private employees in, in North, northern Minnesota and working with government at the state, local, and federal levels. Her educational experience includes a bachelor's of degree in government and American politics with a concentration in race and ethnic relations from Clark University and a master's degree in advocacy and political leadership from the University of Minnesota in Duluth. Ida and her husband, Jesse, enjoys living on the Iron Range with her two daughters. She is passionate about the great North Woods and enjoys spending time with family, camping, skiing, snowboarding, hiking, and fishing. She also enjoys traveling, reading, baking, and gardening. Members, you will see on your desk that there are support letters from the mayor-elect of Eli, of Eli. There's also Emily Larson, who's the mayor of Duluth. You'll see things from former state senators, but also Mark Phillips, who's a former IRRB commissioner. Um, there's also the, a, a, let, a letter of support from the uh, mayor of the city of Virginia, Tony Sertich, who's, who's now the Rams executive director. Um, also Richard Aldridge, who's the Hibbing public school superintendent. And those are just some of the letters asking for us to support this appointment. Please join me in supporting the confirmation of, of Ida Rukavina as the next commissioner of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation, also known as IRRB. She's de demonstrated a keen ability to think through the issues that face us and works towards solutions that have the best possible outcomes. She will serve the people of Minnesota with dignity and commitment. I ask for you to confirm her confirmation. Thank you, Madam President. Further discussion? Uh, Senator Farnsworth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as, uh, as a proud Iron Ranger, I would like to speak uh, in support of Commissioner Rukavina. The IRRR is a unique agency with a unique, did I say chair? I mean, thank you, Madam President. Um, just realized I think I got that wrong. I apologize. Anyway, the IRRR is a unique agency with a unique mission, and we need somebody with the knowledge of the region, knowledge of TAC and ITACs, knowledge of the agency, and I believe that Commissioner Rukavina is uh, the person for the job, has the understanding of the region, of the agency, uh, of the mission, and so I will be voting to support um, this nomination. Thank you. Senator Halschild. Thank you, Madam President. There is not a better person on the Iron Range to be the next commissioner of the IRRB. I have experienced Ida's leadership, much like the rest of the Iron Range delegation uh, throughout our region over the past several years, whether it's housing, broadband, economic development, Ida has a, has a unique ability to bring communities together, to bring, bring people with differing opinions together to talk about the real challenges that impact our communities. Um, politics can, can get a little dirty sometimes, but Ida is focused on the economic issues that hit people uh, in, their, in their pocketbooks, and I think she will be a tremendous leader of the IRRB. I look forward to working with her and am in full support, and I hope you'll vote alongside me in support of her confirmation. Thank you. Senator Champion. Lastly, I ask for a roll call vote. There will be a roll call. There being no further discussion, we will vote on the motion by Chen Senator Champion that uh, the Senate, having given its con advice, do now consent and confirm the appointment of Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation Commissioner Ida Rukavina. The Secretary will take the roll. Senator Friends. Thank you very much, Madam President. I would like to report, report that Senator Putnam votes yes. 
Senator Putnam votes aye. And Madam President, I would like to report that Senator Morrison votes yes. Senator Morrison votes aye. All senators who desire to vote have voted. The secretary will close the roll. There being 43 ayes and 19 nays, the motion prevails and the appointment is confirmed. Senator Latz. Madam President, I move that the report of the com from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety reported on January 25, 2023, pertaining to appointments, be taken from the table. All in favor of that motion, please say aye. aye. Opposed, say no. The motion prevails. Senator Latz. Madam President, I move that the foregoing report be now adopted. On that motion, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say no. The motion prevails. Senator Latz. Uh, Madam President, I move that in accordance with the report from the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety, reported January 25, 2023, the Senate, having given its advice, do now consent to and confirm the appointment of Department of Human Rights Commissioner Rebecca Lucero, effective January 2, 2023, for a term expiring January 4, 2027. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Latz. Uh, Madam President, I request a roll call. There will be a roll call. Uh, Madam President, uh, Commissioner Lucero is a highly qualified and respected leader who leads one of the strongest civil rights enforcement agencies in the country. She works tirelessly and intentionally to make sure that every Minnesotan in every corner of the state can lead lives full of dignity and joy, free from discrimination. As both a civil rights leader, or civil rights attorney, and an agency leader, she is dedicated to making sure the department runs effectively and efficiently while thoughtfully managing its resources. She has implemented many process improvements to make sure the department is providing good customer service to parties and state contractors. Prior to this administration, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights was primarily focused on processing cases. Under the commissioner's leadership, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights has transformed nearly every part of its work to embrace the full power of the Minnesota Human Rights Act. You can see the results of this work through the many cases the department has announced over the last four years. The Minnesota Department of Human Rights is small, with only about 48 employees, and I am continuously impressed with how impactful their work has been and continues to be. Underpinning the work of the commissioner and her department are relationships. Commissioner Lucero prioritizes building and strengthening the department's reputation and relationships with community organizations, human rights commissions, attorneys, and many of us legislators here. Commissioner Lucero is a great partner, easy to get in touch with, and always brings energy and solutions to complex issues. Uh, Nanoko Sato, Executive Director of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, had this to say about Commissioner Lucero. As demonstrated from her time at the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, Commissioner Lucero is an exemplary servant leader, working to ensure the needs of those around her are met before her own. She leads with empathy, compassion, and joy in all areas of her work, prioritizing collaboration and community-designed solutions. While she excels in strategic leadership, broad landscape analysis, and big-picture thinking, she is also detail-oriented and willing to be on the ground to get the job done. She is fearless in facing tough challenges head-on, especially when she can see how the work can benefit people and the communities around her. For these reasons, she has and continues to be well-respected by peers, community members, leaders, and stakeholders alike. I encourage members to support the confirmation of Commissioner Lucero. For the discussion, <clears throat> Senator Dibble. 
Um, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, I rise in support of confirming uh, Human Rights Commissioner Lucero um, for many reasons. I think she has uh, shown herself to be eminently qualified, extremely capable, uh, and has done a, a tremendous service to the state of Minnesota in her time as commissioner. Um, in particular, uh, Madam President, I especially appreciate um, how proactive uh, and uh, how personally she's applied herself uh, to this work. Madam President, members, uh, Senator Latz, uh, Commissioner Lucero has never hesitated uh, to pick up the phone and call me personally as she's mm -hmm. seen mm -hmm. uh, my LGBTQ community come under attack, uh, come under uh, pressure, uh, experiencing higher rates of violence, often violence that's uh, beget at the hands of those in uh, positions of uh, power who are uh, generating all sorts of mythology and misinformation and denigrating my community. We see 600 bills across the country that would seek to simply marginalize, if not fully erase, members of my community. Uh, and the attacks have been unrelenting uh, and extremely concerning, uh, both the, the uh, policy attacks uh, to marginalize my community as well as the violence. And Senator Lucero has called me up personally to ask how she can help and what she can do and how she can be of support. And I know she does this with a number of members as well as community leaders across the state to figure out how her agency and her effort and time can, can be spent to make sure that we all are part of Minnesota, that we are all welcome, that we all can prosper and thrive and be treated fairly because that's the essential fundamental foundational job of government to make sure that, that as we move through our work life, as our civic life, our uh, personal lives, that, uh, that we feel safe, that we feel uh, part of things, that we can enjoy the prosperity and the economy uh, that this state has to offer. And many people are not allowed to do that because of the actions of others. And Commissioner Lucero is working very hard every day to make sure everyone is equal in the eyes of the law and can be safe and can prosper. So I enthusiastically support this confirmation. Thank you, Mr. Pre Madam President. Senator Umu Verbaten. Thank you, Madam President. I rise in support of the confirmation of Commissioner Rebecca Lucero. We are so lucky to have such a fierce advocate in Commissioner Lucero for advancing civil rights and ending discrimination in Minnesota. Right now, um, we are facing <laughs> such racism, transphobia, ableism, anti-Semitism, um, discrimination and hate across our country, across our state. And Commissioner Lucero has really been on the front lines of building a Minnesota that's inclusive and welcoming to all. The Minnesota Department of Human Rights has done tremendous work to make sure that our schools are safe and are welcoming of our transgender and non-binary students. And as a member of our LGBTQ caucus, that means a lot to me personally. They have also done tremendous work to make sure that our state is free from sexual harassment and assault. I know that Commissioner Lucero understands that disability rights are civil rights. And that is why they work to make sure that our LA fitness centers in this state are accessible to all people with disabilities. You know, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a rise in hate, uh, anti-Asian rhetoric, uh, and so many members of our community felt unsafe. And they stepped up the Department of Human Rights and launched a discrimination hotline. Others also talk about um, the amazing leadership of Commissioner Lucero. They call her a visionary leader, um, someone who protects human rights, who believes in equitable opportunity for all, and also someone who inspires her staff to do that work. She inspires me in this work as well. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Madam President. So I rise uh, in opposition to this appointment. There have been several troubling policy decisions that have been made uh, at the Department of Human Rights uh, that I wanted to highlight. Uh, the first is a bill that the Commissioner in the Department of Human Rights is supporting uh, for tracking of having a database of hate and bias incidents that do not rise to criminal behavior. And the commissioner spoke in favor of that. And to go to that regard of 
we need to focus on crime and criminal activity, and there are uh, hateful criminal acts that are committed, and they need to be dealt with. We've talked about that, the failure of, of properly prosecuting uh, and penalizing uh, those who commit crimes. But to start tracking our citizens for whatever is defined as hate and bias incidents, which often turns out to be no more than disagreements with uh, other people of Minnesota that have differing viewpoints, uh, smells like dangerous countries around the world that control their citizens, such as China or others that are uh, very dangerous uh, in how they deal with their citizens' human rights, and that is not the direction uh, that we need to follow, and it is troubling uh, that this department is uh, going along and pushing support of that. Uh, during the pandemic, there was uh, many people that I know that I spoke with that filed reports with the department because government unfairly targeted their livelihoods uh, and closed down their businesses, including some business owners that were people of color, and the department did not do anything to help what appeared to be the government position of you're going to be closed and stay closed until uh, the governor grants uh, permission from on high uh, to allow you to open back up. And when the department should have been stepping in on behalf of the rights of human, uh, of, of our Minnesota citizens, of the livelihoods of many of these people around the state, some of whom I spoke to, and some who were small business owner, people of color, just baffled my understanding. Uh, and finally, uh, Madam President, it was very disappointing to learn over the weekend that the department uh, made a decision uh, to uh, ruled in the USA powerlifting case uh, for, uh, for requiring uh, trans athletes to compete in women's sports. And I understand that that is a, a, a very uh, contentious issue uh, and many, uh, many accusations and misinformation get slung uh, back at conservatives when we stand uh, to fight and support women's sports. Uh, but I passed out an article uh, where an African-American uh, newscaster on ESPN uh, really came down hard on that decision and pointed out the hypocrisy of making that decision uh, against female athletes and highlighted in the article that it's even ironic that that decision was made during Women's History Month. And so, Madam President, this, uh, this department needs to get back on track with common sense policy solutions for the state of Minnesota. They've run a field of that uh, in multiple areas, and that is why I am not able uh, to support the confirmation of this commissioner today. Thank you. Uh, Senator May Quaid. Well, thank you, Madam President, and I rise in support of the confirmation of Commissioner Lucero. We have seen um, horrific attacks on black, brown, indigenous people, people with disabilities, the Asian community, trans and LGB community members, and I, I really wanna speak to the attacks on trans people. It was not Commissioner Lucero who ruled in favor of J.C. Cooper against USA Powerlifting, it was a judge, because it is illegal in the Minnesota state to discriminate against somebody on the basis of their gender identity or gender expression. That is a decision that the Minnesota legislature made in the 90s. We were the first state to enshrine protections for transgender people in our Human Rights Act. I'm very, very proud of that. And it is befitting that this decision would come down during Women's Hist History Month where we know that sports are better when we're inclusive. Commissioner Lucero knows that too. Minnesota has had trans inclusion in sports for the better part of a decade. The International Olympic Committee, the NCAA, all trans inclusive. In fact, girls participation in sports in the state of Minnesota is higher than any other state, in part because we are inclusive. Commissioner Lucero is so incredibly dedicated to ensuring that every Minnesotan can live free from discrimination in places of public accommodations and education and employment. This commissioner has ensured that 
we have a better state to live in where we can all thrive. And I'm so proud to rise in support of her confirmation, and I look forward to casting my vote in favor of her. Thank you. Senator Port. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I rise in support of con confirming uh, Commissioner Lucero. Uh, we've been working with the commissioner just this week on, uh, on ensuring that we have housing that is accessible to all, that is not discriminatory. Uh, she has been helping us, she and her staff have been helping us to make sure as we are crafting policy that we have the best information and we understand how the Human Rights Commission works with our laws in Minnesota to protect Minnesotans from discriminatory practices. She has been forthright. Uh, she has responded quickly and with the information requested in a way that has helped us move our legislation forward. And, and I really commend the way her office has, has responded on that. Secondly, I just want to say in this moment, as Senator May Quaid raised, we are seeing unprecedented attacks, particularly on the trans community. And in, in regards to trans girls playing sports, trans girls are girls. And policing trans athletes hurts all athletes. And it invites the gender policing of any of our girls because you think they look like a boy or they have short hair or they have longer legs or they're stronger. And having a strong Human Rights Act here in Minnesota has meant that those girls have a safe place to play sports. And playing sports and being part of a team is something that we have seen has incredible effects on confidence, on ability to connect in your community, on ad advancing to higher education, it should be open to all. And I am proud that Minnesota is a place where we protect our trans community. I strongly support the confirmation of Commissioner Lucero. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I rise in support of my three daughters and my wife and my mother and all women. Um, my mom is a teacher. Uh, Senator, and excuse a, me, Senator Wiesenberg. Senator Latz, for what purpose do you rise? Just trying to get your attention to be oh, put on the list I after you, Senator I, Wiesenberg. I, I Thank certainly you. will return to you before we take a vote, Senator Latz. Excuse the interruption, Senator Wiesenberg, please. Thank continue. you. I will, I will start over, uh, Madam President. Fine. I rise to support my three daughters, my wife, my mother, and all women. Um, my mother is a teacher and a volleyball coach and a softball coach. She's been involved in sports her entire life, and she had to fight very hard when she was growing up as a young female to be, to just get into sports because it was a male-driven thing. And she fought hard and she's won many trophies and she's had to battle for her rights. And we got there and there are, you know, people who fought for women's rights. Um, you know, biology and science isn't hate. We don't hate people. I don't, it's not my thing what other people do as adults, but we don't hate, hate you. Um, I. You know, as I was running, I ran into someone who I never thought I would run into. Paula Overby was a transgendered woman who was a man, and after his children grew up, because he didn't want to confuse his children, decided to transition into a woman. Now, Paula Overby was Point against this. Point of order. Uh, Senator May Quaid. I'll state your point of order. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize. I don't have it right in front of me, but we can refer to Ms. Overby with she, her pronouns as she intended. Thank you for the Madam remind. President, point of parliamentary inquiry. I am speaking. I uh, just want to uh, remind the members um, to be respectful of one another and not to interrupt one another unless you have been recognized. Um, uh, Senator Lucero, may I ask Senator Wiesenberg to continue his remarks? 
I will have a point of parliamentary inquiry afterwards, and that, that's fine. Thank you. Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I apologize. I will refer to her as he, sure, he, sorry, I misspoke. She, her, did not agree with this because this is harming young females like my daughters who are in volleyball and softball. Uh, it is not fair to my children or any female children to compete against biological males because they will never win again. And that's what could happen if this continues. I feel, I don't know what I feel. I feel there's something that we need to work on with what's going on, but it's not fair to my children to compete against boys. It's, it's not right. I would strongly urge a no vote on this, Commissioner. Thank you. Senator Lucero. Point of parliamentary inquiry, Ms. Madam President. State your point. Thank you, Madam President. When, there, when another member is, has the floor and they're speaking, and another member seeks to rise in recognition and they cite a point of order, is it custom and usage that the member who's rising uh, on a motion of a point of order, that they cite the point of order before they speak, or is that uh, something that's not customary? Um, Senator Lucero, on occasion, um, a member doesn't have their rule book in front of them to refer to with the um, particular point of order. Uh, Senator Mayquay did not refer to the, to the uh, rule, the rule or any rule. Um, you you uh, rose up. Um, seemed to me that the best solution to the, the situation that we were finding ourselves in was to um, ask Senator Wiesenberg to uh, continue his remarks. With respect. Further discussion? Senator Latz. Um, before I call on Senator Latz, however, uh, is there anyone else, uh, since it is his motion for the uh, confirmation, is there anyone else who wishes to speak prior to him? Seeing none, Senator Latz. Thank you, Madam President. My view on confirmations has always been that really the judgment of the Senate ought to be reviewing and rendered on the basis of the underlying qualifications of the proposed confirmee. Um, and while there may be disagreements with some policy judgments, uh, we're in a situation, our, our constitutional responsibilities are such that we give advice and consent, but there's historically been a, an anticipated amount of deference to the appointing authority, the governor, that won election statewide to select a cabinet that reflects the governor's values, principles, and policy priorities. And that our review should be principally focused on the underlying professional qualifications of the appointee. Commissioner Lucero's underlying qualifications are, in my judgment, indisputable and unassailable. Whatever you think about the policy positions she takes, or whatever position you take, or whatever you think about her discretionary or judgment calls in enforcing the Human Rights Act, which, by the way, was enacted by this legislature. The language in the Human Rights Act became law because the Minnesota House of Representatives and the Minnesota Senate, signed by the governor, enacted law to do this. And it has been upgraded over the years, or changed over the years, and if there is a disagreement with what the Human Rights Act says, the proper channel for changing that would be introducing a bill, getting it passed into law. <clears throat> now, other members of this body have already addressed some of the issues that were raised. Um, and I'm going to address a few that haven't been. One is, 
Not all reprehensible acts are criminal in nature. Yet, an incident that is bias motivated, even if it cannot be proven to be a criminal act or isn't even covered by our statutes, ought to still be identified as such so that we as state policymakers have evidence to be able to make informed judgments upon when we are passing laws. And the fact is, we cannot pass a law constitutionally that criminalizes bias. We can't. Under the United States Constitution, we cannot do that. That is why what we have in Minnesota our penalty enhancement procedures or provisions when there has been an underlying criminal act that has been committed and a person has been convicted of that. Only under those circumstances, and by the way, the case was a Minnesota case that came to this conclusion, RAV versus St. Paul, and it had to do with a, a cross-burning incident in the front yard of a St. Paul residential house. It was a U.S. Supreme Court decision. Only after there has been a criminal conviction for some other underlying conduct under some of our Minnesota criminal statutes, sentencing may be enhanced or made more severe if there's a determination that the motive for committing the criminal conduct was bias, if it was motivated by the race or the gender or the sexual orientation or the nationality or the skin color of the victim of the crime. And that's why we have some crimes in Minnesota, including assault, which are considered to be more serious for purposes of sentencing because of their motivation. And I'm the proud author of the bills that enhance those criminal penalties for assault. I've been the proud author of bills that have sought to expand the bias crime penalty enhancement provisions um, to other uh, crimes as well. Uh, I've been the proud author of the bills um, that have, as was already mentioned, provided for the collection of data of incidents in Minnesota. And Senator Umu Verbaten is carrying that bill uh, this year. I'm a proud co-author of it. The fact is that these incidents happen, and we can't stick our heads in the sand and pretend they don't. They are pernicious because they affect all of the community that belongs to the category of persons that are targeted by the biased conduct, not just the individual that is the target of the specific conduct. And unfortunately, there has been a failure to properly collect, gather, report the data of these kinds of incidents across the state. So we felt it necessary to introduce a bill that would emphasize and, in fact, require the re uh, recording and reporting of this data so that we as policymakers can determine how much of a problem do we have here in Minnesota and how do we address it so that all people in Minnesota, regardless of their race, color, religion, sexual orientation, gender, live fulfilling and safe lives. So, members, the analogy to authoritarian countries is so off base that I hope we will soundly reject that suggestion here in our final vote for the commissioner. Now, I'm not familiar with the pandemic actions that uh, was mentioned earlier, but the Human Rights Act authorizes the Department of Human Rights to enforce the Human Rights Act, not to get involved in other agencies' responsibilities. Uh, so if they were enforcing the Human Rights Act, then that's their job. 
whether you like the content of the Human Rights Act or not. That's their job. Members, Commissioner Lucero is eminently qualified. She has earned your support for Commissioner, and I would really like to see a strong bipartisan vote in support of human rights in Minnesota and this Commissioner in particular. Thank you. Senator Lance removes his, renews his motion that the Senate, having given its advice, do now consent to and confirm the appointment of Department of Human Rights Commissioner Rebecca Lucero. The Secretary will take the roll. Senator Prince. Thank you, Madam President. I report Senator Putnam votes yes. I'll remind the members that we're under a roll call. You should be at your own desk. Senator Prince, say again. Yes, thank you, Madam President. I report Senator Putnam votes yes. Senator Putnam votes aye. And Madam President, I, revote, I report Senator Morrison votes yes. Senator Morrison votes yes. Have all members voted who desire to vote? The secretary will close the roll. There being 38 ayes and 26 nays, the motion prevails and the appointment is confirmed. Next item on the agenda is um, uh, 13, announcements of Senate interests. Senator Frentz. Thank you very much, Madam President. Members, I wanted to let you know that today uh, is officially Clean Energy Business Day in the state of Minnesota. And from the official proclamation, we hear Minnesota's energy efficiency and clean energy businesses are innovating and delivering clean, reliable, and affordable solutions, helping the state to achieve its 100% energy goal. As a matter of fact, we're fortunate to have a lot of these Minnesota businesses on energy efficiency and clean energy here today at the Capitol meeting with many of you. I want to give them a warm welcome and also invite all of you to a Clean Energy Business Day happy hour at Capitol Ridge from 4.30 to 7 p.m. this evening. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Senator Friends. Without objection, the following members are excused. Senator Housley, 11 to 11.40 a.m., Senator Liskey, at uh, noon to the end, Senator Lang, 12 noon to the end, Senator Farnsworth at uh, 12.15 to the end, Senator Miller, 12 noon to 12.30 p.m. Senator Klein. Madam President, the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection will meet immediately after adjournment in G15. Any other announcements of Senate interest? Uh, Senator McEwen. Thank you, um, Madam President. The Senate Labor Committee will likewise meet immediately um, after we adjourn here. Any other announcements? Senator Port. Thank you, Senator Rest or President Rest. Uh, the Housing Committee will meet 15 minutes after adjournment, and the Housing DFL Caucus will meet in the President's office immediately after adjournment. Further announcements of Senate interest? I have one more um, announcement of a, a request for it to be excused. Give me a second. Uh, 
Um, Senator Pratt from 1210 to 1230. Any other announcements? Senator Dietzik. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Um, first, Rules Committee will, uh, the Rules Subcommittee and Committee will meet about five, ten minutes after we're done here. Uh, and then I know there was a question on deadlines, and I know um, Director Alexis Stengel sent out a memo that I believe went to everybody on February 28th that has um, some more descriptions on what deadlines mean, so I will um, reflag that to everybody if you have questions. I know the first deadline is uh, coming up tomorrow, and in the, the memo she does says what happens after first deadline and before set, second deadline, so she does outline that, so I refer you, refer you back to that memo. Um, and then on uh, Monday, Monday, March 13th, we're going to start a little early. We are going to um, come in early, go into a joint session with the House, and meet with the, excuse me, 11 tribal leaders from across Minnesota. Um, there'll be lunch will be provided, and then the Senate is going to leave and come back and do committee work in the afternoon. So uh, with that, Madam President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, March 13th at 9 a.m. On the motion, all those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. The Senate is adjourned. Mm -hmm.